Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhills.church to watch or listen to past messages. We hope that you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Let's thank Belinda for her testimony this morning. God's grace available when and where we need it. That's the theme of the sermon series, Help is on the Way. This is the final sermon in this series, if you would. Turning your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter number 14, where we see Moses in one of the darkest moments of his life, and then God shows up and shines brightly. We're excited about this final sermon because it is our entry point into our summer. Uh, so much happening in our summer right here at the church that we're very excited about. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the exciting things happens tonight at 515. In fact, Valinda, who was on the screen, she's a part of that ministry. It's called Fuse. It's our student ministry for all teenagers. And if you have a child going into sixth grade uh, this fall, or a child that is all the way in, in high school throughout that entire teen years, uh, we want you to be involved and know about tonight's special parent-teen meeting, tonight at 515 p.m., and uh, I'm going to be introducing to you our youth staff and telling you all about the summer plans when it comes to all the things that the teenagers will be doing this summer and into the fall when it comes to the weekly Bible study and activities. So we encourage you to come back at 5.15 for that. Immediately after at 6 o'clock is Fuse, our teen ministry, as well as a Bible study for adults and children's program for children all of all ages. That's tonight at 5.15 and then 6 p.m. Also this summer, very exciting, uh, two weeks from today is June 4th. And on June 4th, I'll be starting a brand new sermon series we're excited about. I'll tell you more about that next week. But on June 4th, we also have our Connect class restarting. So if you are new to Southern Hills Baptist Church, this is what I want you to do. In the seat in front of you, if you're on the front row, it's in right the seat behind you, there's a little green card. That card is your access to be involved with Southern Hills in a deeper way. You can find out more about our membership classes, and you can find out more about connecting with us as a whole by joining our Connect class. It is a four-week class that begins on June 4th. Now, if you're interested in finding out more about it, go ahead and take that card out, place your name, phone number, email address right in it, place it in the offering plate as it goes by. I think you're going to love that class. It meets every Sunday morning and you, for four weeks, and you have an opportunity of learning about it. I, I'm in that class at the end of this service. My wife kicks off that class, and you're going to enjoy that if you've enjoyed the church. So make sure if you're new to the church, fill that card out and place it in. And then one last thing. This is our first way to announce this, first time to announce it. This summer, we are going to be hosting a marriage seminar right here at Southern Hills. The marriage seminar is going to be taking place on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursday evenings starting the second week of June. I'm just telling you about it now. You're going to find out more information throughout the, throughout the weeks to come. If you're interested, at the end of the service, mark that you're interested on our connection card. The connection card will allow you access to that marriage seminar. It's going to be Tuesday nights, Wednesday night, Thursday night, same information, and it's going to have a small group element. It's going to have a lot of teaching. You say, well, who should come to this? If you're married, you should come. If you're in a committed relationship, you should come. If you are not married but are interested in the concept of marriage, if you're single, you should come. It's going to be a fascinating time, and I want to encourage you to find out more about biblical relationships and how relationships can last by coming to this uh, seminar coming up. I hope that you will. Okay, uh, all of the commercials are out of the way. Let's get right into the sermon series itself. The, today's sermon is the final sermon in the series, and it's entitled, When I'm Feeling Trapped. What do I do when I feel like there is no way out, when I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place? When I feel it's a catch-22, I'm not sure that there's a right answer. I'm not sure what the right answer is. I'm not even sure if there is a right answer that I can choose the right answer because I'm not sure which it is. A lot of times we find ourselves in these situations, and for us, we're going to find a beautiful analogy of this. Right in the book of Exodus chapter 14, where Moses finds himself between a terrible situation and a horrible situation. In Acts chapter 14, verse 10, and it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And Israel was sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, my prayer today 
over the next 35 minutes is this is that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit as you have already filled it with your people. You would fill my mouth with your words, that we would understand the word of God, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would illustrate it so that we can understand it, and that every man, woman, teenage boy and girl in this room, we would grasp the truths so that we can be better disciples for you. Bring change into our lives and into our hearts. Do, God, what only you can do. Cleanse our minds and thoughts of all other things so that we can focus upon your truth today. For so many of us truly do feel trapped. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. My son is a baseball player. Uh, he's uh, not a professional baseball player yet too bad because if that ever happens he needs to give me all his money and i get a name when he when he started a baseball team he changed his name how many of your children have done this to you we named him jonathan we start going to the baseball games and parents start asking us are you jt's parents and i say jt who's jt jt right there jt he looks just like you i'm like his name is jonathan he changed his name and everybody on the team calls him JT. Everybody at school calls him JT. I think it's a little ridiculous. He changed. How many of you agree children do not have a right to pick their own name? How many of you agree? <laughs> By the way, this has nothing to do with the sermon. I'm just a little upset about it. And I thought the best way to deal with it is to publicly shame my son. Amen. <laughs> he's a great baseball player. He really is. Um, he's great at the plate. He does very well in the field. But he really shines as catcher. In fact, his coach recently said about him that uh, not, not a lot of kids want to be catcher. That's not necessarily a desirable position because it takes a lot of toughness and whatnot. And, and he said, no, I've got the gear. I'm ready to go. I want to be a catcher. So we joined this new team. And uh, man, I love it because I love watching him because the ball never gets by him. And we call him the wall. I mean, every ball that comes to him, man, he's going to stop it no matter what. And uh, I love this. But my favorite moment about him being a catcher is when there's a play at home. Because that's the moment that he shines or fails. I, I love watching the ball float in to home plate. And there my son is. He grabs the ball. And suddenly, here comes the kid running down the pike. Several times I've seen this happen. He'll grab the ball. And his job is to stand firm, right? His job is to stay there when all of a sudden this other kid's charging. And part of me is like, yeah! My wife is sitting there, my little baby! <laughs> and I'm like, hit him! Hit him! Hit him. I don't want him to hit my son. I want my son to hit him back, you know. You say, that's violent. I know. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm so proud. I'm so proud. This, these kids will come in, and they're tough at this age, too. They'll come in with their shoulder down and just, bam, barrel right into him. And he holds onto the ball and just takes it like a man. And I'm like, that's my boy. You know, not once have I seen the ball fly out, which is awesome. That's awesome. But my favorite thing that I've seen several times is when a player is rounding third and starts to run toward home, but the ball gets to home before the player does. And suddenly, the player notices that my son has the ball, and he stops on the baseline and turns around. What is that called? What is it called? For baseball fans, you know it's called getting in a pickle. It's called a pickle. And my son will rip his mask off, he'll take the ball, and he'll say, pickle! And everybody begins to run around. And, and what happens is he takes the ball, he throws it to the third baseman. The guy starts running back to third base. The third baseman's got the ball. He starts running at the guy. The guy turns around starts running home. My son gets the ball again, and they start going back and forth. How many of you understand what it is to be in a situation like that? How many of you have ever found yourself in a pickle? How many of you ever found yourself in a situation where you think to yourself, if I go this direction, I'm going to be out. If I go this direction, I'm going to be out. And you begin thinking to yourself, not only is there a right solution, how can I find the right solution? This is what we are as is, is humans. We are those who are prone to impossible situations. We find ourselves continually in impossible situations where we feel trapped, where we feel like there is no right answer, where we have no idea what we're going to do next. And sometimes we get ourselves into those situations, and sometimes our God actually puts us in those situations. So today's sermon is about that moment, the moment you find yourself in an impossible situation where there is no presumable right answer. I 
I've had said to me, Pastor, I know, I know, I know God doesn't like divorce. But what do you do when they serve you papers? I want to be a good father, I've heard. I want to be a good father, but how can I be a good father when she won't even let me see the children? It's an impossible situation. I know my job doesn't bring glory to God. I know what I do does not honor my creator, but what else am I supposed to do? I have no other marketable skills. These are the things that have been shared to me. And what I'm sharing with you today is that sometimes there are no easy solutions. Sometimes there are no easy answers. Sometimes God puts us in a pickle, or sometimes we find ourselves in an impossible situation because of something we've done. And the question is, what do you do when you're feeling trapped? I will state this as we begin this morning, that impossible situations are divine opportunities. We view impossible situations as something we never want to come across. I don't want to be put in that situation. But stop before you get there and realize this truth, that impossible situations are often divine opportunities for God to do something in you, through you, and for others. So before you bewail your situation and bemoan your status, stop and realize, wait a minute, instead of praying myself out of this situation, let's pray through this situation. My question to you is not, how do I get out of it? My question is, why would God bring you into this impossible situation? That's what I want you to think through today as we look at the story of Moses. The story of Moses is fascinating because poor Moses finds himself having just led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Do you remember Moses? Moses is standing there, beard flowing, rod held high, looking into the face of Pharaoh, saying, let God's people go. I mean, through a lot of drama, eventually he does let God's people go. And now Moses finds himself as the leader of two million freed slaves, walking through the desert on his way to the promised land. And all of a sudden, Egypt gets upset that he let his people go. He gets angry. He gets nervous about it. And Pharaoh sends an army of chariots after them to bring them back. His goal was not to kill them. His goal was to recapture all of Israel and bring them back. And the Bible tells us that Moses finds himself in front of the Red Sea. On one side, he has an impossible, uh, an impossible river slash sea slash uh, a body of water to get through. On the other side, the Bible says, Pharaoh's armies are coming against him. If you look at the geography of where God has him, there are great mountains impassable on one side, a great ocean of water on the other, and coming up from behind and on the side is an army. Talk about an impossible situation. I want us to see this truth as we begin today, and that is this. What do we do in impossible situations? Number one, impossible situations are designed to bring glory to God. We're contemplating this question, why would God put you in a difficult situation? Here's my reason number one. Number reason number one is this. Impossible situations are designed by God to bring glory to God. Think about that. There is a reason why God has allowed you in this situation, whether you put yourself in it or God put it. Could it be that the reason you're there is because God desires glory from it? I'm going to get back to that thought in just a moment, but I want you to look at verses 2 through 4. Look at Exodus chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. Notice verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can look on the screen. Speak to the children of Israel so that they turn and camp before Piharioth, be between Megiddo and the sea, and before Belzaphon. Okay, now stop right there. How many of you, verse 2, that was a blessing to you. Can I get an amen? <laughs> How many of you love verse 2? Is that your life verse? Your favorite verse? Put it on a t-shirt. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 2. Why would we even take time to read this? It's because in the story, God tells Moses precisely where to camp the people. 
How many of you have ever been camping before? Raise your hand. How many of you campers? How many of you will not go camping because you're civilized, right? All right. <laughs> some of you are like that. I love going camping. I know some people are like, I am not going out there. That's why God gave me a house. Amen. <laughs> well, okay. Imagine you're going to go camping. I'm a camper. A lot of you like to go camping. Imagine you're going to go camping, and when you pull into the camp, all of a sudden, God speaks to you. Joshua. Yes, sir? That's the campsite. What campsite? You begin walking over. This one, Lord, 14C? No. 15C. If God spoke to you about which campsite, first of all, how many of you would be a little freaked out, right? <laughs> and how many of you also would try to pick the campsite God wanted you to pick? Now imagine you're Moses and you've got to pick a campsite for two million people. God, in this verse, gives very specific instructions on exactly where he wants them to set up camp. That's going to come back to be very important in just a moment. Look at verse 3 as it goes on. And he says, opposite to you, this shall be the sea. So he says, I want you to park, uh, park yourselves right by the sea between these different places. Why? For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are confused in the land. The wilderness shall be shut them in. So I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he shall pursue you, come after you, and I will be honored because of Pharaoh and because of all of his army, so the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. God literally puts Moses between a rock and a hard place and a coming invasion and a sea. He literally puts him in an impossible situation. Now, you might be asking yourself, why did God do this? And some of us have bad theology. We think to ourselves, God did this because Moses was a bad guy. And we think bad things only happen to those who are bad people. But that's not true. Here we see God puts him in a very bad place for one reason, so that God can receive honor and glory. God says, I want you to be in this situation, and when you are in that situation, I'm going to come save you at the last moment, and everybody will praise my name. Could it be that the impossible situation you find yourself in is part of God's plan for you, not to make you happier, but to give him more glory? Could it be that your life is not about making you happy? Could it be that your life is about bringing glory to God? Could it be that it's all right as a disciple of Jesus, one who has received Christ's salvation, one who has been baptized and follows Jesus and says, I declare myself to be a disciple, I have decided to follow Jesus, could it be that God puts you in a situation for one reason, and that is to bring glory to him? That's exactly what happens here with Moses. See, I think we're asking the wrong question. When we find ourselves in these difficult moments, we ask questions like, why is this happening? Does it matter? We ask questions like, when is this going to end? Does it matter? Instead, we all ask the question, how can I bring glory to God in this moment? What can I do, not to get out of the situation, what can I do in the situation that will bring glory to God? Why? Because it is His glory not your happiness that is the goal. Have I lost some of you? Perhaps I have because that's not popular in American Christianity. Today, in American Christianity, it's all about if you do this, this is what you're going to get out of it. The fact is it doesn't matter what you get out of it as long as God gets the glory. Amen. And sometimes God puts us in that situation to bring glory and honor to him and him alone. I had just graduated from college. And as you know, every college graduate will know this. The moment you graduate from college, all of your dreams come true. <laughs> Everything you ever wanted. My wife and I um, were living in Las Vegas. We had just moved back to Las Vegas, went to school in Florida, moved back to Las Vegas. We were living in a friend's of a friend's house. We had nowhere to live, and, uh, and, and somebody said, hey, I have a friend who has a house, and he can't sell it, so would you like to stay there? We said, sure. We walked into the house, and the house was a bit of a, a mess, so we had to clean a lot of it. Um, I'm allergic to animals. Um, that's why I don't go into a lot of homes. I, I'm allergic to animals, and the house had... A carpet and it was this I'm telling you it was <laughs> it was this thick with cat and dog hair it was bad but we had nowhere to live right 
So my wife and I went in there and we got permission from them that we say, could we pull out the carpet if you're gonna be redoing it? They said, yeah, we're gonna be redoing it with tile. Nobody's living there, just pull it out. So we spent the couple days. How many of you have ever, it, those who understand allergies, have you ever been in that situation? Oh my word, man, I'm pulling up this carpet. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> for a couple days, got it all out, praise God, it was awesome. By three or four days out, it was done, and for three or four weeks, I was dying, you know what I mean? But, but at least we had a place to live. It was funny, as we pulled it all out, it, it was left, I'm not a professional carpet puller outer, and so when we, <laughs> when we left it, there was a lot of glue that was still up and strands that were, it's kind of a mess. It, you would not trust, you would not want to live there. But we had a place to live. We had a roof over our head. We had signed up for this ministry. I was a part of a church across town. I was in an internship position, so I didn't really get paid, and, and I really didn't have any other option, but at least we lived here. We didn't have any furniture. We had a, we had a mattress, and we had a, um, a, a box spring. We also had a computer, and we had nothing else. And uh, I remember we set up our computer, and we set up our little box spring, and I remember what we did. We, we would, every night we would come home, and we would play... Um, uh, Oregon Trail. How many of you remember Oregon Trail? We play Oregon Trail. It was awesome. Our, you know, we'd, we'd always lose our caravan in the river, get dysentery, you know. <laughs> Didn't think you would come to church and hear that, huh? And we just do this every night. And we were doing this one Saturday evening. They're playing Oregon Trail. And all of a sudden, we got a knock at the door. It was Saturday. We'd been there for six weeks. We got a knock at the door. Saturday night late. Now, Sunday for a pastor or even an intern pastor, somebody who's 22, ready to serve God, Sunday is everything. Everything is set for the next day, the next Sunday, the next morning. I had multiple children's programs that I had to put on, counseling throughout the afternoon, a Bible study in the evening I needed to be part of, counseling after that. It was a busy day ahead of me. And they knocked late on Saturday night, and it was my friend's friend who owned the home. And he said, hey, guys, how you doing? We said, good. He said, hey, got some news for you. You need to be out of here by Monday morning. Okay. And I remember shutting the door, and I remember looking at my wife, and I remember her beginning to tear up, and I remember my eyes wide as can be, and I remember her putting her head on my shoulder, and I remember thinking, what do we do? Like, where do we go? There were two solutions for us. There was, we're out on the street, or we move back in with my parents. And so we moved on the street. <laughs> no, no, <I'm> just like, <laughs> obviously chose the better thing. So we moved back with my parents. That's not easy. We joke about it, right? It's young people moving. I got to tell you, I know what it's like moving back with your parents, having succeeded in life, and then now you're back. I know what that's like. I know what it's like moving into your childhood bedroom with your new love. <laughs> That's awkward. <laughs> it was during those few months, that impossible situation, that I look back on now and I see there were moments that I was able to connect with my father in the morning watching him read his Bible that I'd never been able to see prior to that. Never saw that before, really. I'd seen it as a child, but not as an adult man. Conversations that happened in the backyard that I would never had, would have never had. My wife was able to connect with Anna, my mother, in, in a way that she had never been able to before. What was an impossible situation ended up being a beautiful thing that brought glory to God. Pastor Josh, it was so amazing. Would you go back now? No. <laughs> and that's very true of impossible situations, is it not? Once we get past them, we look back and see what God was doing in them and through them, and we thank God for what he brought us through. But why is it that even now, as you are in the midst of an impossible situation, you're able to look back and say, I see how that brought glory to God. I see how that was good. But we're unable to do that in the impossible situation we find ourselves now. Could it be that God is doing the same wonderful blessings and glory to himself in this impossible situation that he did in the past? And I believe the answer to that is yes. Why would God bring you into this impossible situation? First of all, impossible situations are designed to bring glory to God. Number two, in an impossible situation, understand this. Never doubt in the dark what you knew in the light. 
Never doubt in the dark what you knew in the light. Here's what I'll tell you about an impossible situation where you feel trapped. While you're there, you begin to question everything. You're sitting there facing the diagnosis. You're sitting there facing the breakdown and the destruction of the relationship. You're sitting there facing, what am I going to do with these kids? And you ask yourself, I don't know what's next. And I wonder if I should have in the first place. How many have ever started second guessing everything because of where you find yourself now? Let me tell you this. While you're in the darkness, don't doubt what you knew to be true in the light. This is what happens with the children of Israel. They are scared to death. The Pharaoh and his army is coming. War is upon them. I mean, thousands of chariots are coming after them to come right after them and take them back to Egypt. They're scared to death. I think the sight of thousands of chariots apparently drove all memory of God's assurances out of their mind. And such is the case in our lives. Look at verses 11 and 12 in our passage today. It says, then they said unto Moses. Now we skip ahead a little bit. And the Bible says all of the Egyptians' uh, chariots are there. And the war is upon them. And the Bible says all of the people started running up to Moses. And this is what they said. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that we have taken us away to die in the wilderness? How many of you like sarcasm? How many of you like sarcasm? Some of you. They're like, sure, Pastor. I like sarcasm. Right? All right. Here's sarcasm in the Bible. They literally come to Moses with a sarcastic question. They ask Moses, were there no graveyards in Egypt? Is that why you brought us out here to die? Moses took his rod and he hit, no, he did not. He did not do that. <laughs> they're freaking out, man. They're so scared because they're in this impossible situation that they begin questioning whether or not they should have come here in the first place. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Why did you save us? Why did you bring us out of slavery? Who do you think you are to follow God's plan? Wow. Look at the next verse. He go, they go on. I think the next verse is on the screen. They go on. It says, is this not the word that we spoke unto you in Egypt? They said, didn't we tell you this way back there? Didn't we tell you this would happen? We told you, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it is better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. This is what they said to Moses. We told you back in Egypt we did not want to go with you. Wait a second. If you study the Bible, that's never in there. In the actual story, they never said that. And it would be inconceivable to do so. Think of the story for those who may not know. Moses shows up, says, let God's people go. Pharaoh says, no. And God says, until you let God's people go, there will be plagues upon the land. God sends 10 terrible plagues upon the land. Everyone knew these are God's people. And all of God's people said, I see the signs of God, and God is calling us to follow Moses. Everybody knew they were supposed to follow Moses. Nobody questioned that they were to follow Moses. But now they're away from the blessing of God, or they feel they are. And they begin to question whether or not they should have followed God in the first place. They remember it poorly. We told you we didn't want to go with you. Not true. You know what happens to us? What happens to so many of us is that we give our lives to Jesus Christ and we say, save me. Save me from my sin. I'm sick of it. Save me from caring so much about what other people think. I only care what you think. Save me. Save me from my friends. Save me from myself. Save me from religion. Save me. Take me. I need you. And we call upon God to do this saving. And you know what he does? He saves us. And once he saves us, he gives us a new life. Walk this path. Obey these commandments. Follow in my grace. And we do, don't we? We follow the Lord everywhere he tells us to go. We enjoy the blessings of God in our life. And then there's a moment where he brings us into an impossible situation to bring glory to himself. And then what do we do? We begin looking to God and saying, I never wanted to follow you in the first place. Why did you put me in this situation? Perhaps I should have never come with you to begin with. We do this all the time to God. We second guess our even fellowship of who he is. 
Notice the last verse here in verse 12. It says, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They're being so, look at me, look. They are being so overly dramatic here. And that's something for me to say. They're being extremely dramatic. Overly dramatic. First of all, they're not going to die in the wilderness. The Egyptians are not coming to kill them. They're coming to enslave them. And secondly, they're not going to die in the wilderness because God promised them they're going to be fine. Listen to me, friend. Don't be overly dramatic about your impossible situation. You have a God in heaven who saves you from impossible situations. You have a God in heaven who specializes in the impossible. Oh, what's going to happen to me? Maybe I should have never followed God. Who does he think he is? Relax. Trust God. How many of you believe we can trust God? Say amen. amen. Certainty. Certainty we can trust God with. Certainty, my mother is a strong woman of certainty. She knows. You ever met somebody that's kind of like, ah, I don't know. That is not my mother. <laughs> she knows. You ask her about politics, she knows. <laughs> Everything. Even things there's no way she could know. <laughs> she knows. Ask her about health. Man, you eat anything in front of my mother, she will tell you that'll cause cancer. <laughs> that causes cancer. How, how many of you know somebody in your life that everything you eat will cause cancer. Everything, <laughs> everything causes cancer. She knows. She is certain about every, man, I mean, she's a woman of strong certainty. She has a strength about her. I was walking with my mother. Um, it's probably about, uh, I, uh, probably early 20s. Maybe it was the time we were living at their house, but we were, we were up at uh, Zion National uh, Park. How many of you been to Zion in Israel, Arizona? Fantastic park. We're up there hiking the Narrows. Anybody know where that is? So we're hiking the Narrows. It's a beautiful hike, and then you can get in the river and start walking up the river. It's awesome. Uh, one of the things you got to be careful because the water flows over the stones, and those river rocks can get very slippery. I remember as we're going, she was very certain about, you're going to slip and fall. Don't slip and fall. Don't slip and fall. Do not slip and fall. We're like, Mom, we're cool. You know, it's going to be fine. And all of a sudden, I remember her saying, don't slip and fall, and she slips, <laughs> and she falls. And as a son, it is not appropriate to laugh. <laughs> I learned this. <laughs> I learned. She fell, and it really did scare me, because as soon as she fell, she screamed. I'm walking right beside her, she screamed like bloody murder. I've never seen this from my mother. She is a strong woman and she fell and she she sat up in the water about about right up to her waist and she held up her hand and this finger was this way and then i screamed ah! <laughs> scared me to death and i watched her and her finger was like this and she, i saw this i will never forget it it's so traumatic she grabbed the finger and she went ah! <laughs> she put it right back into place and she and i'm like ah and she's looking at me going, ah! That is 100% true and has nothing to do with the sermon. It's crazy, this woman. I should have shared that on Mother's Day. Certainty. Listen to me. You can question a lot of things, but to question the ability of your father to save your soul, to question the ability that once you've been saved, you've been always saved, to quest, listen, to question his ability or his desire or his love to save you out of this impossible situation, where does Israel get off questioning whether or not they should have followed God in the first place? We lack this type of certainty today as they did even in the days of antiquity. Friend, God has called you out of a life of slavery to sin, bondage to opinion, freed from society's rat race, no longer a man of the world, but rather a child of God. Don't you understand? You're different. You are to live differently. You are to think differently. You are to react differently. You are to fight differently. Because you've been saved. When encountering hardships, on the Christian life, the good old days seem a lot better than they really were. The life of a disciple 
is never easy, but it's always worth it. Following God out of Egypt is never easy, but it's always worth it. As Jesus teaches in the wilderness and people choose to become his disciples and follow him, it's never easy, but it's always worth it. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, to truly be my disciple, you need to eat my flesh, drink my blood. Your life needs to be all about me. And the Bible says, many turned from him in that moment because his sayings were hard. It's never easy to be a disciple, but it's always worth it. And when the going gets tough, disciples often want to go back fishing. Such is what happened to Peter, James, John, and Andrew after the death of Jesus Christ. Peter didn't know what to do. This was an impossible situation. I thought he was the Messiah. And he says to the disciples, I failed. I'm no good to follow him. Maybe I shouldn't have followed him in the first place. He's in the grave, for goodness sake. I go a fishing. At this point, Peter truly already believed that Jesus had resurrected. He knows that Jesus was alive, but he did not think he could continue to follow Christ. And so he went back fishing. Friend, listen. Stop believing that it was a mistake to follow Jesus simply because it becomes difficult in the process. He has allowed you an impossible situation to bring glory to God and to further your cause or further his cause through you. He's brought you into an impossible situation because he wants you to understand to not doubt in the dark what you knew to be true in the light. The days of no, ch sometimes we think as Christians, boy, it doesn't look great before I was a Christian. I mean, look at it. The days when I didn't have to get up and go to church. The days where I didn't have to get up and go to small group. The days whenever I didn't have to get up and read the Bible and pray. The days when I didn't have to do the right thing. Boy, isn't it easy being a slave to Egypt? And I'm telling you, the lie of the devil is still out there to us. We second guess everything. L look how bad second guessing is. Let me just demonstrate it. Second guessing how bad it is. Some people will never be successful in their career because they keep second guessing their career choices. Have you ever known somebody like this? Every two or three years, they're just not sure, so they try something else. Do you see how damaging that is to a career? Second guessing. Some people will never be successful in a relationship because when it gets difficult and tough, they keep second guessing the relationship. I'm just not sure. Maybe they tried something different. Like, do you see the damage of this? And the same is true in our spiritual life. Stop doubting when it gets dark what you knew to be true when it was light. Because it will get dark. I want us to see from this story today what it's like when we face impossible situations. First of all, impossible situations are designed to bring glory to God. Number two, never doubt in the dark what you knew to be true in the light. Number three today, and this is our final thought and you're going to need it. His big move will be unimaginable and breathtaking. For Bible students, or those who even watched the Ten Commandments growing up, you know what's about to happen in the story. The big Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptians behind them, big rocks on one side. What's going to happen? See, already you have been spoiled. You know what's going to happen. Moses is going to take his rod. He's going to hold it up. The waters are going to part, and they're going to walk through on the Dead Sea oh, on dry ground. But here's the question. You know that, but did they know that? Yes or no? Okay, so some of you don't know. No, they didn't know. So I'm going to ask it again. You know they're about to walk through the Dead Sea on dry ground. But did they know that? No. no, they didn't know. To them, the idea of walking through the Dead Sea was unimaginable. Let me say something about what happens next in impossible situations. The next move is a big move. It's a God move. It's not a you move. It's a him move. And when it happens, you're going to look and say, I could have never imagined how he would do this. And it'll be breathtaking. Sure, five years from now, you'll be able to look back and say, I cannot believe what he did. Of course you can't believe it. You have a mortal mind like I do. Why is it that we doubt him when he's always saved his people in the midst of darkness? Look at this story. Look, look at it because it's beautiful. Verses 13 and 14. I love this. It says this. It says, but Moses said unto the people, fear not, stand firm. That is, stop being afraid. You're the people of God. Stand firm. Stop moving around. 
and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see again. This problem that's facing you, the problem that's coming after you, once you pass through the land, you'll never face that problem again. I love that. Look at the next verse. It goes on. The Lord shall fight for you while you hold your peace. This is huge. Hear this, Christian. God will do the fighting. You relax. What's the point of having a God if you've got to do all the work? Let me stop and say this about salvation. Some of you still are under the false realization and thought, listen, that the only way that you're going to ever get to heaven is if you do good things and God likes you more. Hear this, hear this. If your salvation of your soul is dependent upon how awesome you are, good luck. And my question is, what's the need of a God who saves? If you can save yourself, you're your own God. See, God is in the business of saving. He's in the business of bringing restoration. And I love that this is his move, not yours. But look at verse 15. Oh, I love this. He does say, what do I do? Okay, I'm waiting. What do I do? The Lord said unto Moses, why do you cry out unto me? He says, stop praying. Have you ever thought in the Bible at once there would be a moment where God says, stop praying? What? First of all, he says, it's my move. I will make a way for you. But then he says, why do you cry out to me? Speak unto the children of Israel so that they go forward. This is what he literally says to Moses. All right, let's go. Huh? Stop praying and tell them to start packing up the camp. What? He's telling them, prepare now because your answer is coming soon. Amen. It's two million people going on a camp out. How many hours do you think it's going to take to pack up their, uh, their, their Coleman coolers? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's two million people. So Moses is saying, I know you see the bad guys. I know you see the river. God's promised he's going to save us. Don't sit here, cry, moan, and weep and say, God, save us. Salvation's on the way. Get up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Do what you know you can do and wait for him to do what you cannot do. Oh. And that's not even the coolest part of the story. Look at the next verse. This is killer. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. This is just the best moment. Like, I love this, right? Hollywood's tried to capture it. I don't think he could capture it the way that, look. Moses holds up his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land so the waters were divided. That is both unimaginable and breathtaking. Like, that is just incredible and beautiful. And look what the Bible says. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea and on dry ground, and the waters were in the wall unto them, both on the right and on the left. Literally around them, there is water. Have you ever been over at uh, Mandalay Bay? And you walk in, and there's a glass enclosure, and the shark is kind of like around you. Imagine that, but there's no glass. You reach in, grab lunch. You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> what I've known about how God saves is this. It is breathtaking. It is unimaginable. And let me say, friend, to you right now, he is right now working toward your solution. Because your God specializes in impossible situations. So what do you do when you're feeling trapped? When you're feeling trapped, know that your father is coming to rescue you. I have three children, but I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, like 60, I don't know. It's a lot of kids. I, I can't keep up. They keep popping them out, man. I don't know their names. Just all over the place. I know one. His name is Lincoln. He's, you know, four and crazy. Is he four? like four or five, something like that. This last year, we were all together as Christmas, having a big Christmas celebration, big family time, and all of a sudden, as we're celebrating, we hear a scream from the other room. Ah! One of the kids. We have a lot of kids around. Nobody freaks out too bad. We lose one. We have plenty. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Relax. 
It's Trey. We walk around the corner, and he has his head caught in the railing. You ever see a kid do this? Iron railing, you've done this? Head stuck in the railing. <laughs> Keep it down, we're trying to have a good time, you know? <laughs> this is one of the most emotional kids, and I'm telling you, he really is emotional. When he's happy, he's happy. When he's sad, he's sad. He was a very emotional kid. And he's crying, and he's crying one word. Daddy, 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 daddy. He just doesn't know what to do, and all of a sudden, his daddy comes. His name is Neil. And Neil comes up to him, and he comes up to his son. He calms him down, and he takes those bars. <laughs> and I can imagine the way it is in a little boy's mind. All he needed was to pull it just a little bit, and the kid's fine. But imagine the way it is in the mind of that little boy. His daddy grabs those bars <laughs> and begins to pull them apart like Superman. And all of a sudden, <laughs> little Lincoln's head is freed. And what does Lincoln do? Can you picture it? He falls into his father's arms, and he rests right there in the nook of his shoulder, and he begins to weep softly. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy. Look, your impossible situation, it ain't that big of a deal to your father. You may have gotten yourself there, or you may have been placed there by God. Regardless, call out to your daddy. He'll save you. Let's pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connect at southernhills.church. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhills.church slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach people around the world. 